Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi, and today we're having a look at a piece of technology that is definitely not vintage, but is still interesting and honestly weird enough that I thought it was worth covering on this channel. This is an LED lantern produced by Joy Ingenious Lighting, and while this might look normal on the outside, what's really weird about this product is that it is powered not by batteries or a wall adapter or even solar panels, but a tea candle. So this actually has a thermoelectric converter in it that converts the heat from the candle into electricity to power these LEDs. Now, I know what you're thinking. This has to be an example of chindogu, the Japanese art of unuseless inventions, along the same lines as, say, a solar-powered flashlight. After all, why would you go through all this rigmarole? Why not just use the candle for light? But when you start looking at this from a thermodynamics and conversion efficiency perspective, it actually starts to make a lot more sense. So when it comes to converting energy into light, candles and other traditional sources of flame are really, really inefficient. For example, paraffin wax has an energy density of around 37 kilojoules per gram, and a tea candle consumes around 2 milligrams per second, which translates to a power output of 80 watts. Now, of that 80 watts, 0.04 watts, or 0.05%, is actually converted into visible light, the rest being given off as heat. So it logically follows that if we could capture uh, just a portion of that heat, convert it into electricity, and then use that electricity to run a more efficient light source, such as LEDs, we could produce far more light than the candle could on its own. And that is exactly what this lamp accomplishes. Now, the thermal conversion is accomplished using something called a thermopile or thermopile, not to be confused with thermopylae. And this is composed of multiple thermocouples linked together. And a thermocouple is a junction of two dissimilar metals arranged such that when one side is heated or cooled relative to the other, an electric potential will form. And if the thermocouple is connected to an electric circuit, then a current will flow. And this is known as the thermoelectric effect or the Zeebeck effect, named after German physicist Thomas Zeebeck, who discovered it in 1821. Zebek was experimenting with a circuit made of dissimilar metals and found that if he heated that circuit, then the needle of a nearby compass would deflect. And initially, he thought he had discovered some sort of thermomagnetic effect. But it was later determined that the magnetic field came from the electric current induced in the circuit. And in 1834, French physicist Jean-Charles Pelletier discovered that the opposite was true, that if you pass a current through a thermocouple junction, then one side will heat and one side will cool. And this phenomenon, known as the Pelletier effect, is used to this day in a variety of products, such as portable electric drinks coolers. Now, the Zebec and the Pelletier effect, which are both sides of the same coin, are based on PN junctions, which we briefly covered in my previous video on crystal radios. So an N-type material, which includes metals and certain types of semiconductors, is one with an excess of electrons or negative charge carriers, while a P-type material is one that has a deficit of electrons, or put another way, an excess of positive charge carriers or holes. Now, depending on whether the N or the P side of the thermocouple junction is heated or cooled, either electrons or holes will flow from the hot side to the cold side, creating an electric potential. And the degree to which this occurs is given by the thermopower or Zeebeck coefficient, which has the units of volts per degree Kelvin and is different for every material. And the Zeebeck coefficient can be positive or negative. If it's positive, this means that holes will travel from the hot side to the cold side. If it's negative, it means that electrons will travel from the hot to the cold side. Now, in order to get maximum output out of a thermocouple, the Zeebeck coefficients of the two metals need to be as far apart as possible which means that although theoretically any two metals could be used to make a thermocouple, in practice only a handful of combinations are actually used. And the most common ones are actually given industry standard letter designations. For example, B, R, and S type thermocouples are made of platinum and rhodium or a platinum and rhodium alloy. C, D, and G thermocouples are made of tungsten and rhenium. E-type thermocouples are made of chromel, which is a nickel-chromium alloy, and constantan, which is a copper-nickel alloy. 
J-type thermocouples are made of iron and constant tan. K-type thermocouples are made of chromel and alumel, which is an aluminum and nickel alloy. M-type thermocouples are made of nickel and molybdenum in combination with nickel or cobalt. N-type thermocouples are made of nicrosil, which is a combination of nickel, chromium, and silicon, and nicel, which is nickel and silicon. P-type thermocouples are made of palladium, platinum, or gold. And T-type thermocouples are made of copper and constantan. There are also a number of other types, including chromel and gold or iron alloy, platinum and molybdenum alloy, iridium and rhodium alloy, platinum gold palladium, antimony bismuth, copper iron, as well as semiconductor types based on bismuth telluride, lead telluride, and calcium magnesium oxide. Now, one of the most common uses of thermocouples is in temperature measurement in applications ranging from consumer digital thermometers to industrial furnaces. Now, it's important to note that thermocouples don't actually measure absolute temperature. They only measure temperature relative to the cold side of the junction. And thus, the temperature of that cold junction must be known at all times. And there's two basic ways of doing this. The first is to maintain the cold junction at a constant temperature by, say, immersing it in an ice water bath. The other more practical method is to use another type of temperature sensor, such as a thermistor, whose resistance changes with temperature, to continuously monitor the temperature of the cold side of the junction. So this thermistor would be calibrated to a certain reference temperature and would continuously monitor and compensate for any deviations from that baseline temperature. Another common application of thermocouples is in power generation, though since the average thermocouple has an output in the millivolt range, you typically need to wire several of them together into a thermopile in order to produce a usable voltage. Now, one of the more interesting applications of thermopiles is in radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which are commonly used in spacecraft, such as the Pioneer 10 and 11 and Voyager 1 and 2 probes and the Curiosity Mars rover. And this consists of a sealed canister filled with pellets of plutonium-238, which gives off a considerable amount of radioactive decay heat. And this heat is converted into electricity by a set of thermopiles linked to radiative heat sink fins. And while the power output of RTGs is only around 200 to 400 watts, they have no moving parts, they're very robust and reliable, and thus ideal for use on such deep space missions. So this brings us neatly back to this lantern. So let's actually take this apart and see exactly how it works. Now, if we open up the front door, we see we have a little tray for the candle that automatically slides out. And this is surrounded by a radiative heat sink, which gathers the heat given off by the candle and radiates it up to the thermal generator. Now, the actual LEDs are in this hood assembly here, which can either be pressed down to create more of an ambient lantern effect or raised up for use as a reading lamp. And to start taking this apart, we need to undo these four screws at the top. We can see we have our two wires coming from the thermoelectric generator, and we can just pull those off their spade connectors. And then we can take out our whole inner assembly, though to do that, we need to unclip this hinge from the automatic sliding mechanism for the key candle by pushing down on these tabs and sliding the tray forward. That comes out just like that. Right, so if we remove this little sheet metal cover, we'll see that we have a set of aluminum fins with a circular hole running up through the middle. So the hot air from the candle is going to rise up through here and be absorbed by the fins and transmitted into the thermoelectric generator. And at the top here, we have something very interesting, which is this dished disc riveted to the top of this vent. And on this are printed the numbers 2061. And this refers to a type of bimetallic material also known as DIN type 1577. Now, as the name implies, a bimetallic material is a composite composed of two different metals sandwiched together. And these two metals have different coefficients of thermal expansion, meaning that when the composite is heated, these two metals are going to expand at different rates, causing the whole thing to bend. And bimetallic or thermostatic materials like this are widely used in thermoelectric switches, like the ones in electric kettles, which automatically cut off the power once the water has started boiling. In this case, this bimetallic disc is acting as a thermal airflow regulator for the candle. So when the candle heats up, the hot air is going to cause this disc to bend down and cover the vent, trapping the hot air inside the lantern and allowing the maximum amount of heat to be converted into electricity. 
However, after a while, the oxygen inside the lantern is going to be consumed and the candle is going to burn more dimly, the temperature is going to drop, and the disc is going to curl back up, allowing air to flow through the lantern and the candle to burn again. And so via this negative feedback loop, this disc maintains an optimum airflow through the lantern that minimizes the amount of heat that is lost to the environment. So really a clever little design feature. Now in the back here, we have this big heat sink, which acts as the cold junction of the thermocouple or thermopile. And if we then undo these screws, then we can pull out our thermopile, our thermoelectric converter that is sandwiched in between the heat collector and the heat sink. Unfortunately, there are no specifications stamped or printed on this thermopile, meaning I'm unable to determine its conversion efficiency. However, the most efficient thermocouples, such as bismuth tellurium and germanium silicon, have conversion efficiencies of around 6 to 11%. So to make a conservative estimate, let's go to the lower end of the scale and say that this has a conversion efficiency of 6%. Now, of course, a lot of heat naturally escapes from this lantern, so let's be conservative again and assume that only about three quarters of the candle's power output reaches the thermal converter. So the 80 watts of thermal power emitted by the candle are converted to 3.6 watts of electricity. Now, the efficiency of modern LEDs is between 25 and 50 percent. So if we again err on the conservative side and use the low end of the scale, our visible light output is 0.9 watts, meaning the system is 22 times more efficient at converting the energy stored in the wax and delight than the candle itself. Yet despite this, the question remains, if you still have to buy candles in order to keep this running, then why not just buy batteries? What is the point of this product? And well, I can see one or two situations where this would actually make sense. Say you have an off-grid cabin in the woods and you already have a large supply of candles for illumination. Well, if you're going to burn them anyways, why not burn them more efficiently? And also, if worse comes to worse and you run out of supplies, including candles, then this could theoretically be adapted to burn lamp oil, wood, other things, giving you a lot more efficient light than just burning those materials themselves. So this is still marginal in my mind as a product, but I can see some applications for it. And honestly, what this really reminds me of is the film The Matrix, in which the intelligent machines that have taken over the world use the thermal and electrical output of human bodies to generate power for their civilization. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking, however, because humans are terrible thermal generators. At rest, we require around 2,000 calories, or 8 megajoules per day, to survive, an average power input of around 8 kilowatts. However, at rest, we emit only around 100 watts of body heat, a conversion efficiency of only 1.25%. By contrast, if the machine simply took all of those human bodies and the food that they were feeding them, which according to the movie is other humans, Silent breed is people! and burnt them in an oxygen environment, they could achieve combustion efficiencies of up to 80%. And that heat could then be used to generate steam and turn a turbine and generate far more electricity than human bodies alone. But then again, I'm not an all-powerful AI. What do I know? Or am I? Anyway, that's all I have for you today, but before I end off, I've noticed recently that a lot of you are very upset every time I do a sponsored ad read. And while I have a lot to say about that, suffice to say that YouTube ad revenue really isn't enough, and I, like other YouTubers, have to find alternate sources of revenue in order to keep bringing you content. But if you want to reduce the amount of ad reads I have to do in the future, why not head over to my Patreon and sign up to support the channel at only $3 a month? And just to sweeten the deal, if I can get to 150 patrons by June 1st, then I will raffle off this very weird but very interesting candle-powered LED lantern, which is brand new except for the minor amount of use I've put it through in order to make this video. So if you're not already a patron, go over to Patreon and sign up. If you are, keep doing what you're doing and send me a message indicating that you want to enter the draw. I'll then draw the names after June 1st, and the lucky winner will walk away with this very neat, very bizarre product as featured on the channel. Now, I'm going to be away on vacation for most of the month of May, so the channel is going to be quiet during that period. But when I get back, hopefully I will have more fascinating content for you. Until then, thank you for watching. I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.